we have a full program and each one of you has a role in this program. We're going to begin with her story, the story of Suzanne Ross. And we all hold a different piece of the story. Susan, come, it's you. Start with and the then people Renee that know the and Eric. Okay. They knew me and Cotton. Everybody will say a little bit of what they know, and we're going to create this story. Come on, Susan. Susan is a fabulous person who does ceramics. I love her work. She loves my work. And here she is. I love your work. Hi. Well, I know Suzanne, believe it or not, since um, about 1952. I know Suzanne since, believe it or not, about 1952, 53. So we've done a lot of growing up since then. And um, she was a good friend of someone, and I was a good friend of that same person, and we ended up at the same college together. And we roommated for a long time. And uh, luckily, we both graduated. <laughs> Miraculously. <laughs> Miraculously, yes. Uh, uh, college in the city, Barnard. And Susan was a brilliant mathematician at a time when very few women were going into math. And she took all her math courses over at Columbia, not at Barnard. So she never really bragged about it, or people didn't know that about her, but it was really quite remarkable. When I was failing math at Barnard, she was taking courses over at Columbia. So before the next person goes, right? So I met, I met Suzanne a long time ago, and, and someone is in the 70s, yeah. But in the 70s, sometime we met and we were fighting. But that's not even important. What's imp the major thing, the major thing is that the way that I remember Suzanne is that she came from this place where they made... Um, Belgian waffles. <laughs> where they made waffles. And I would always say, you know, the one that was born out there where they make waffles. So she was born out in Belgium. Okay, 80 years ago, I have, I always have, I have very few uh, European friends and they all happen to be uh, born in Europe for some reason. Right, that's right, <laughs> Diana. Yeah, um, close, very close. So, uh, that's, that's very important. Welcome, 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 make sure you eat. If you don't eat, you can't talk. So the first thing you do is go get some food. <laughs> anyway, so real important that she was, is a Holocaust survivor, right? And I think you were five when you? I, I was three when we left Europe. <clears throat> I was four when we left Europe. <clears throat> and for those who don't know, we ended up in Mozambique, eventually for a few years. That's where I developed as a child, and I swear to God, I developed as a child in Mozambique, watching how black people were treated in Mozambique, in chain gangs. Well, we went to the playground. Black people were gardening in chain gangs. And I remember my mother tried to take me away not to look. So those are some of the early memories. The first one, of course, was the Nazi Holocaust. And second, I began seeing something was off here in the rest of the world. It wasn't just about Jews, but there was something else, so. Okay, so she wasn't a college student right away, you know, she, <laughs> <laughs> she had to, she went to school, they had hard times, her parents here, and um, eventually I think they ended up in, uh, far in Far Rockaway. So she has this story before she got to college, but I'm gonna pass it to you, you could add to the story. Okay, um, I'm Renee, and uh, we're going to fast forward to 1970 when I was at Hunter College, Hunter Uptown at the time, which is now Lehman College, and um, heard about, I, and I was sort of a hippie queen, um, and 
I heard that I should take this course with Suzanne Ross. Um, and I did, and it was quite amazing. It changed my life um, and politicized me. I'm a little too embarrassed to say what the comment I made in the class that <laughs> that made Suzanne think, I gotta take this, this girl under my wing. And um, she was a mentor to me. She, was, she became a fast friend. She, be, she inspired me. She made me understand the world in a different way, provided me a new lens in which to see things. And to this day, you know, I often say, now what would Suzanne do here? Okay, I can't do quite that. Best friends, wonderful, great friends, and um, she, has, she spent a lot of time in Amherst coming up in the summers, and Clara Anna, from the time she was teeny weeny, spent time with our kids, and I, I guess that's enough. I should stop. Anyway, I love her dearly, and love everything she's done for me. Okay, so more, more of the story. We're trying to get through this 80-year story real fast. Can I tell the story what Renee, can I tell the comments you made? Yes. So, since it's my birthday, I'm allowed to even embarrass people. So, Renee was a beautiful, beautiful hippie when she came to my class. She, her hair was so long, down to her waist. She always wore long dresses. She always came into my class with wet hair. I can't remember. I think she had swimming before. She always came with wet hair. And... Um, she was just a hippie, right? Everything was gonna be wonderful and things were great. And one day, we were talking about oppression in the United States or in New York or something and Renee piped up. She says, why doesn't everybody just move to the country? And I said, what? <laughs> and that was a whole couple of lessons. And Renee was great. She never forgot it. She always raised it again. Hi, Bronxy. Everybody know Bronxy? Okay, so we're going to move on with the story, and Naomi, come on. Ah. <laughs> well, well, we don't actually talk very much publicly about how we first met, because it's not widely known that Suzanne was a member of the Weather Underground. Um, it was not public for a long time. I guess it's public now, but... Uh, <laughs> we, Suzanne says the first time we saw each other, we weren't supposed to be in the same place, so we didn't recognize each other. Um, but Suzanne was known as the uh, gourmet chef of the Weather Underground, <laughs> as, as we were living on pennies a day. Anybody that was lucky enough to know Suzanne had a, a, li a little bit better, a, a little bit better something to eat. Um, so after. Uh, after the Weather Underground, actually, when we when people start when the Weather Underground broke up, I think that's when we really bonded over having been through that experience together, and um, really spent a lot of time analyzing it and talking about it together, figuring out what was right and what was wrong, what we did right, what we did wrong, um, and then we both ended up having kids around the same right around the same time, actually. Um, <laughs> I found out that I was pregnant with Lonnie the same week that Suzanne found out that she was going to be able to adopt Clara Anna. So Clara Anna is exactly nine months older than my son, and our kids grew up together. Um, and we've had a lot in common as, as Jewish anti-Zionist radicals and as people... <laughs> um, and as anti-imperialists and people trying to struggle with, as white people struggling with anti-racism. So we've, I've learned a lot from Suzanne. The anti-racism part, I learned a lot from Suzanne about how to, how to commit your life to anti-racism. So I thank you for that. Um, and we will, okay. and may it, may it continue in, in, uh, in Jewish, there's a saying, till 120. You should live, you should live till 120, so. Fidel's 20, 120, 20 year plan. Uh, so, she surfaced, right? 
She was swimming in those waters and doing all wonderful things, and then she surfaced. And I had the privilege of meeting her in struggle, um, taking some serious political stance around um, Angola in 1976 um, and supporting solidarity movements all over the world. And many of you met Suzanne when she did surface and she was active. But the fun part, you know, you always have fun part. The fun part for me was that Clara Ana and Amir Gal, my son, went to the same public school. And um, we were in the parents' association, watch out world. <laughs> <laughs> and, our, and, our kids, and our kids were fierce, you know? They were fierce and um, we, there some actions that we did, I want Clara not to tell her favorite action at the Board of Education. Oh. I don't even remember you that. You remember how old you were? No, how old was I? How old was I? I was six. Ref, you were at this. What demonstration was it for? <laughs> It was for what? Right, so all I remember is it was cold. It was cold, I think. We went to go pee, and then I came back, and Espy had a cop grabbing his tie, yelling in his face that we had to go into the building or something. <laughs> the building. <laughs> For years she said that I did not beat up the cop, but yes, we did occupy the building, the four of us. We occupied a lot of things. We once occupied a, um, the assembly office up on 116th Street with 100 kids from the school. So we did occupation with kids, and our children were in the forefronts. And it was amazing work. The next generation wasn't speaking. He's not yet. We're not, not yet. there yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's been many, many, many years of struggle. And the next person to speak is right here. <laughs> Wait. What? Yeah, actually we did, you know, they didn't cut back the school because it got around that a hundred kids had taken over. All the kids went to do was pee. Pat. I'm doing her Okay. That's what I do. I, I am Suzanne's do it person. <laughs> uh, she got me doing stuff and, okay, when I met Suzanne, she had me doing exactly what I'm doing right now, running around doing everything. <laughs> and, uh, but no, I met Suzanne at the um, art thing for Mamiya, right? The, uh, the art event and uh, the big... At, at, at 120, at, um, what's that place on 127? 127 West 127th Street. What's that? I can't remember. It's in Harlem. <laughs> what's it called? It's, um, it's a place where Alambe had events. Where? Well, I can't be heard. Oh. Harry Tubman. The Dempsey Center. Oh, okay, well, I don't remember that one, but what I do remember is, you know, like Suzanne seemed like she's always been here, and, uh, um, and I can't tell when she wasn't, and, uh, but I do remember. And uh, cause I I call people two, three o'clock in the morning, ten, you know, while I'm organized. You know how you organize and you really don't realize what time in the morning it is. And Safia Bakari, 
And uh, um, she was saying, you know, this sister Suzanne Ross, you really need to get with it. She said, but let me tell you this, Pam. She says, don't call her after 10. <laughs> and I try to remember that. And uh, But, you know, when you're working, you don't know when 10 o'clock is here. It'd be 2 o'clock in the morning. And you're thinking it's 10 or 4. But Suzanne always was really good, you know, with me. And uh, she wasn't like Safia said, she will cut your head off. She, she did ask me a couple of times why was I calling her then. But when I call somebody, it's usually, I mean, it's always about work. And she forgave me and we organized, you know. Um, Suzanne is just a dynamic force, you know, in everybody's life. I can tell stories where we were having this event at the American Friends and Suzanne drives up and it's a police barrier cone right there. Suzanne politely got out, pulled up, knocked the cone almost over, got out the car, took the car, the cone and threw it over this way and then just continued to park her car. And now Suzanne is a take control kind of person and uh, when we go you know we got work to do um there's so many stories of um suzanne shopping at hanky panky yes <laughs> yes that's one of the places Suzanne showed me where Hanky Panky was at. So if anybody want to wonder where she get these really sharp pieces, not this one tonight, but she's a Hanky Panky shopper, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, being with Suzanne, organizing, she's one of the baddest strategists. And are always strategizing, always seeing ahead. And are, you know, when trouble is happening, I don't know it. And she'd be pulling my coattail, you know, look, check this out. And also, I am just so grateful for Suzanne. And then we have grandchildren that grew up together. I remember when Isabel came on the scene, Clara Anna, when she was young in college, no, high school, and she brought Mumia into this, high her high school, Mumia spoke at the high school. She delivered the first message she ever did to a high school at Brooklyn Friends. <clears throat> Clara Anna, when she was graduating from Brooklyn Friends, arranged for Mumia to send one of his messages which was read, played at her graduation. And as you can imagine, um, my plan had been that maybe we could get some money out of these people because they had a lot of money. Mumia promptly ended up speaking about the Quakers and their role in slavery. <laughs> Whereupon the administration was not so happy about his speaking. Suddenly there were problems about his speaking. The kids fought for him and he spoke. And we, with, uh, several of us were there, but the place gave him a standing ovation. It was really a tremendous victory and Clarana had organized all this and she couldn't believe they were gonna win. She kept saying, they're gonna stop us, they're gonna stop us, but they, the kids prevailed. Like these children, which you'll hear about hopefully later, the children in Philadelphia who just campaigned for and won the creation of a plaque on Osage Avenue in tribute to the MOVE organization. Oh, Brock, let him speak for a minute, okay? I know, just to want, so go ahead for a minute. Do you know what you wanna say? Say happy birthday. Okay, you want to say happy, happy birthday, Mama? Mama. Okay. okay, thank you. And you'll speak, so you'll sing later on. Uh, okay, let him speak. Let her speak. Dude. Okay, okay. So I want to tell you a story. So Suzanne and I were in an organization. It was the first, no, the um, the International Working Women's Day Committee. And it was an organization that started, I think, at the end of, of the 70s and lasted until yesterday, it seems. But what's important was that we would do these unreasonable things, right? So one of the unreasonable things, and some of you were there, was doing the first Iraqi bombing. And people were saying the war was over. And we said the war is not over. And we had a demonstration in silence from, 
from 34th Street all the way, 34th and 8th? Or something, or 7, whatever goes downtown, all the way to Union Square. One of the women of color decided that we had to have a coffin, a.k.a. Nankuruleko. And you were there. And Myrna was there. We got, Alice was there. A lot of people. And so we marched. I think we were maybe 600 strong. I mean, it was, was pretty impressive. And Leila and you were there too. Um, and we, we marched, mostly women of color. And we got to, to 14th Street Union Square. It was over. The demonstration was over. And there was Nankuruleko with this coffin. <laughs> Naomi was there also. And, and there was a, you had a hutch. What kind of car was that? that anyway, they had a hutch. You know those cars that you could put stuff, a hutchback. So we stuck the coffin in this hush, this big real coffin and these two white little white women little white women the little white women took the coffin up to Harlem it was a sight to see right they were, I don't know what happened when they got uptown well everybody in the street Everybody in the street, as we got into Harlem, was staring at the two of us with this coffin sticking out. Of course, everybody assumed there was a dead body in there. <laughs> you know? It was really funny. We finally got there, and they graciously received this coffin, which we borrowed from them. And Naomi and I were thrilled with this experience. We both thought it was very exciting. But it was a story. Only this group, which was crazy, would come up with a real coffin that could barely be carried and for a demonstration. And insisted that only the women could carry the coffin. It was an experience, but it's all about Suzanne being unreasonable, right? That's what it's all about. It's about being unreasonable and doing the impossible. That's what she is basically about. And each one of us have these stories about Suzanne being unreasonable, right? And we know that Mumia is alive because Mona, Pam, and Suzanne are unreasonable. And they have been doing the impossible, have been doing the impossible. And when you, we celebrate birthdays, right? I say every 10 years, celebrate a birth. You're really celebrating the person's accomplishments. Yeah. So we are here celebrating not only Suzanne because she's just hot and beautiful at 80, yeah. right? <laughs> and still looks like a fashion plate. But because her commitment and because she's so unreasonable and because of her love of the people, of humanity, of the working class, and her deep, deep, deep commitment to people of color. You know, so that is what we celebrate. And um, you, in the process, you will be able to ask questions, make a comment. Um, but they, there's this program that I have to follow, right? <laughs> yes, and I'm not very good with following programs. <laughs> okay, so before we start the program, which we haven't, I'm, a, Mona has something to say. I want to just say a little something, tell you a brief story about Suzanne. And what it speaks to is her loyalty, her... Com 
Okay. It speaks to her loyalty, her commitment, uh, how principled she is, despite a lot of negative feedback, people thinking she was crazy. We were involved in a custody case back in 2002, I think it was, 2004. And um, Suzanne stepped up to the plate, even when a lot of people was telling her she shouldn't get involved, that we're crazy and blah, blah, blah. Suzanne stepped up to the plate. She talked to the move child that was involved in this custody case so that she could see, you know, for herself what was happening with him and everything. Suzanne went into family court for us and spoke to what she saw, what she knew, and didn't take no shit from that judge, you know, she stood strong in what she knew and what she saw, despite a lot of people telling her she shouldn't do it. She should not get involved. Suzanne did it. She did it. And the young man that was involved in that custody case is still with us today. Still with us today. <laughs> So we love Suzanne. She has always been loyal and righteous and principled, you know, despite what anybody might tell her. She knows what's right, and that's what she goes with. So your move family loves you, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. So back to the program, Gladana. Come on, come on. <laughs> my daughter, Clarana, who organized this whole party against my wishes originally and insisted that at 80, she says, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Now's when you should do it. And <clears throat> she, um, anyway, she asked people different questions that they were going to ask me. And Mona's question on the behalf of MOVE was what attracted me to MOVE. And I just want to say a word about the same custody battle. I spoke to the young man this morning, by the way. He said he couldn't come and he was very sorry. And uh, go I'm going to see them this coming week. But when I came into the scene and I had been involved, Clara and, I, and uh, father and I had had split up when she was about three. We had a bitter custody fight. He then was hardly around, but he really wanted to fight me and the custody issue. And, you know, it was horrible, horrible battle. I hated every minute of it, except when I won, which happened a lot of times, actually. But anyway, regardless, it was not pleasant. And um, it never dawned on me. It never dawned on me that I could resist the courts and insist that he not see her that he not see her, because I knew about all these custodial arrangements that were acceptable, and people, judges, lawyers, everybody knows, right? And we have a judge in our midst. <laughs> everybody knows that, you know, this is what the system is. And here I get involved with MOVE, and they say, no way is this child gonna be taken from us overnight, because this father is destructive. No way. And they did not seem to hesitate and seemed to think they could win. And I thought, wait a second, could this be true? Is this possible? So they, we started this battle, and I was supporting them, on the basis, their commitment, that they were never going to turn this child over, overnight, or without the mother being present, because this father was a negative influence for the child, which he was. And I was willing to testify to that. But lo and behold, we won. They won. That child never left his mother for one day. Never left his mother for one day. And I was blown away by that victory. And of course, their principled behavior with children, their attitudes toward children, how they dealt with even the father 
everything about it was very, very impressive. So I loved the militants, I loved the faith they had in victory, and the determination to do the right thing and think that it was possible to win. And that was my first real involvement with MOVE. You know, I supported them politically, but it's different to see that process and see, hey, these folks are different. They fight, you know, they, at the time, people were saying that people, the state is gonna take away the child. They boarded up their windows. They prepared for an armed confrontation. So people were talking big, don't they know what they're doing? In the meantime, they're taking care of business. They were prepared. And all that whole process taught me so much about seriousness, about not backing down, and was a total inspiration to me, not to mention the level of principles and high morality that I have never, never seen in any other organization in the movement. In all my years in the movement, I have never seen that level of principle behavior. So right on move, on a move. Right on. The, the questions? Um, so my mom has been talking about writing memoirs for the last 800 years. 15 years at least. And um, I decided that I wanted to do a documentary on her memoirs as opposed to a book. So I sent an email out and asked a few close people to her if they could submit questions on what? On your life, on your struggles, everything. And we got a few responses and most of the people are here today so I'd actually want them to ask her those questions personally, right? so everyone can kind of be involved in this documentary and, you know, be a part of this experience. Um, so, do you have the list of questions? Uh, do I bring these questions? I do, but I bet the people remember them. Okay. I bet people, and we may have sent one here at the end, too. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll do Mumia's at the end. So, the people who sent questions who are here are Deborah. Um, who else, Clara? Susan, Susan, Naomi, Deborah, Susan, Naomi, who else? Uh, Mona, I answered Mona. I mean, I just summarized what Ramona asked. And also, anybody else who has a question to ask? Now, of course, it's not because just because I'm 80, I'm so wise. I'm not, <laughs> you know? But uh, you do learn some things in life in 80 years. And, you know, I'm certain how to survive. There are different questions. So people should feel free to ask them. Okay. Folks, Suzanne doesn't do anything if it's not collectively. I've been after her to write her memoirs for even a day. We even had plans on how she was going to do it. And she hasn't done it. So your questions is to generate Suzanne in writing these memoirs and putting down on paper her political beliefs and her vision and her understanding of what a different world looks like and how do we work together. That's basically what it's about. So, who wants Deblin? Where's Deblin? She had a question. Deborah? Okay, you're the first one. Deborah. Okay, before we get Deborah to speak, uh, before we get Deborah to speak, I want a moment of loud cheering and applause for our brother Sundiata Sadiq who passed a year and a half ago, and today is his birthday, July 1st. He would have been 75 years old, 76. We all miss him. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for coming out. I only invited people that I love. I just want to say I invited people individually, one by one, that I love. And all of you are people that I love and I want to hear as part of my birthday. So thank you for coming out. We know you We're going to take a pee break. A pee break. Oh, yeah.
Okay, sound is magic, out. magic. He did magic. It's gonna turn off again. It's gonna turn off again. <laughs> so Devlin, I mean Debra. Debra, ask your question. Give Sadiq a little love. Sent out, of course, was extremely just really held um, company with Suzanne. He, uh, he really, at, at all times, uh, respected her, considered her uh, his, you know, good colleague, uh, her, her spirit, you know, all that we're going to talk about tonight. But my question is, you know, Sandiata hailed from Rockland County, where he grew up, and then uh, lived in Austin for many years and was head of the uh, NAACP chapter there in Austin, which was eventually defenestrated by Hazel Dukes. Um, and I just wondered how uh, Sundiata, how, how, how Suzanne came to join forces with Sundiata. That was my question. So there's no question that Sundiata and I, we joined forces and we were really a team in leading the Free Mumia Coalition in New York City. But also another part of our work that a lot of people didn't know about is that we regularly went to visit prisons as a team and spoke at many prisons. With the legal, analytic, it was an, a very powerful combination. I can't even put it all into words. And I have not been able to continue that work since he passed because um, so I get invitations all the time from prisons in New York State in particular to come and speak. Um, I now have approached the, um, Saeed Mohammed to come and do this with me in prison because and he's interested, okay. so we might okay. be able to pick it up. So, um, Cindy Adam, when, when I first met him, it was up at the Bruderhof, it was a sunny day, and he came over to me and introduced himself, and he said his wife had just passed and that he works with the NAACP. And I Gradually, I came to see what he did with the NAACP, and he was really quite brilliant in using this mainstream organization, pressuring them, embarrassing them, exposing their bullshit, particularly Hazel Dukes, head of the New York State chapter, who he had such contempt for because of her corruption, her, her betrayal of black people. He had me call one time, call her when we wanted something or other, and I left a message, I, you know, when they answered the phone, I said, this is Dr. Suzanne Ross. I'm a member of Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, which I am, and, um, a member of the United Federation of Teachers. This woman was on the phone within less than 30 seconds. He had never been able to get her to answer a phone call from him. And he did that. He was able to show that all the time, all the time. He got the rest of us involved. And, um, you know, he was just so skillful of this. I remember when we were trying to pressure the, uh, the national NAACP to support a civil rights investigation, we showed up at their convention in New York at like nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning. And Ben Jealous, a black man, you know, was head of the organization and the vice president was Steve Hawkins, also black, who had actually, Sadiq had actually mentored him when he was a kid. So we come there and of course Sadiq knows them. He says, you go talk to them. You go introduce yourself and talk to them. And he was just brilliant at his ability to use a white person to be useful and to play a key role, and he knew when to do it. On the other hand, when we went to England, hosted by a black nationalist group, I was the one who was invited to be there, and I invited him to come with me, and yet he was clearly the person who needed to talk all the time because he was a nationalist like they were. And so, in that situation, he took the lead. Anyway, we just had this quite amazing, dynamic, and very effective organization. And he really was very supportive to me when some people thought that I had a lot of nerve speaking up as a white person and that I should go to the back of the room and shut up. And some of it was probably right and some was not. And Sadiq turned it into a very, you know, principled question. He said, don't fall for bullshit. 
don't fall for bullshit. If there's something real, we'll deal with it. But so that's how we got involved, and I gradually really understood that that his being a member of the NAACP hardly told the whole story. You had to understand what he did in that, because at the same time he was saying free the land all the time. He was working on political prisoners. He was go he's known all over the prison system, you know, and that's how I got into the prison system, and he wanted me to join as another, uh, I'll just tell you one quick story that was quite remarkable. We went, we were speaking at um, Sing Sing, um, and it was uh, Black History Month or day or whatever, and I'm sitting there in this huge, a few, uh, maybe a thousand black men, and uh, I'm gonna be speaking on Black History Month? I said, this does not make sense. I don't really know very much of black, I mean, I read, I did a lot of homework, but that was not, and I said, you know, I really don't want to, I don't want to talk about Black History Month. So I got up there, and I said, you know what, I can't really speak about Black History Month, but I'll tell you all how I was trained to be a racist. And I told them story after story about what people tried to teach me in college, where I never had to read anything by a black person ever, graduate school, where the attitude toward black people at Columbia, right here in Manhattan, was that black people had nothing to offer, and additionally, that black people could not, I swear to God, could not, were not capable of being introspective. You know, I'm studying psychology. Somebody asked, why aren't there more black people in the field? Because black people are not introspective, because they're so busy surviving, they don't have time to be introspective. So when I told story after story like this, spontaneously it was not what I was going to speak about. When I got up, when I finished, I got a standing ovation from the brothers in that audience. And Sadiq said to me, see, that's what you have to offer. And that's really useful. So that's, Sadiq played a phenomenal role in the Mumia movement, in the Free Mumia Coalition, in my development, in... Um, just so many things. And we j I just got an invitation again from Otisville, a prison upstate in New York, asking me to speak. And the brother said, you know, I really am sorry that I never said more when Sadiq passed. But at one of the prisons, they put together a booklet of all their letters and responses and what Sadiq meant to them. So he left a lasting, lasting impact. And we all miss him terribly. And his birth. Yeah, we said we that's what we said earlier. <laughs> so long live Sundiata. Long live Sundiata. Okay. We will always remember him in our hearts. Um next question, people, we have a list of people, you'll be after them. Who's the other person that had? You have a question, Naomi? Okay. You have a question, Susan? Yeah, I do. That's a very general question. She's tired. Come, come. come. So I've watched her for a very, very long time, and she, she's tenacious. And um, I think everybody would like to know how you keep going. <laughs> Why don't you quit? Why don't you get tired? Why don't you get stopped? And I think all of us can learn from that. Well, all of you, the love and support I get from the people who do give me that is invaluable. Just this last week, Bob Nash, who some of you know, has been driving me around, takes me to prisons when I need to go to prisons, helps me do everything I need to do, does it without ever telling anyone. People don't even know what he does. And I could never be doing this without Bob. I could never have this kind of energy without Bob helping me. And there's so many, there's so many, please thank Bob. And, um, you know, Renee and Eric, 
you know, if, if we need money for something, I'll call them. They never say no. They support me spiritually and in so many ways, even from Amherst, and always thank me for what I'm doing. And that is support. That is very, very important. William Kamakaro. Everybody know William? <laughs> William brought me into the Venezuela work so that Venezuela is so close to my heart and I care so deeply about Venezuela as another aspect of my, you know, my own history, a long history working in the international solidarity movement. But in particular with Venezuela, it's been through William and um, another close friend of ours, Christina Schiavani who's now doing research on food uh, sustainability in Venezuela. And I think it was yesterday, I suddenly get an email from Christina, who's in Caracas in Venezuela, and it's an email with the, her neighbors, children, an older woman, a little a boy, and they all sing Feliz Cumpleanos to me and thank me for the work I've done on Venezuela and for my work with political prisoners and Mumia. And Christina put all this together and sent me this little one minute message. Could you imagine how I felt when I got that? You know what a source of strength that is? Invaluable, invaluable. And where did she go? <laughs> could you come up here, Amelia? Could you come up for a second? <laughs> I met Amelia when she was about 14 or 15 years old. Oh, <laughs> she was one of the young stars in Impact. Yes. Yes. She performed, Hi, <laughs> and at that time, she, uh, we, were, uh, we had an event, a benefit for Mumia at um, House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn. And we had Impact perform and Will Calhoun. An amazing, amazing evening. I was so excited I could barely contain myself at the level of art and love that was expressed that night. And that's when I first met Amelia, who then became a kind of mentor. Where is Isabel? <laughs> she, went, she then became a mentor to Isabel when Isabel joined Impact. And you know, we've talked and we've gone through struggles together and she's been, she brought a whole troop of impact kids to Philadelphia one year. Remember, we, they came on the bus. They were, fan. you see Ramona and Pam and Orin. <laughs> so that's who Amelia is, a young, phenomenal organizer, artist. She performed, she's a dancer. She's an incredible dancer. She went to school in dance where they were harassing her to death because she was not into their conception of dance. And she's hung in there. And I will always, always love Amelia. <laughs> Thank you, Bo. So she's a sort of source of strength, huge source of strength. So that's my answer, Susan. Okay. A lot of people. <laughs> Next question. But I want to add that is something real important about Suzanne. Yes, it is the love of the people, right? However, she does self-care. She takes care of this tiny body to be able to do all the things that she does. She battled Hep C for many, many, many years. And won. And, you know, all of you young folks, one of the things that really change after you're 70 is your, the bottom of your feet. They start hurting. If you see, not today, today she has pretty shoes on. Suzanne's been wearing some serious sneakers to be able to be out there in those demonstrations, taking care of her feet because they hurt, right? We don't have the little fat underneath our feet anymore. So understand that there's a lot of self-care, a lot of self-love, that she really works 
on staying healthy for us. For us. Okay, next question, next question. There was someone before you. Pam? Here, here. Um, Suzanne, tell people how you wound up being the chairwoman of the New York Coalition. That's a story in itself, okay? And how many years? Um, Safia was the great, great founder of the New York Coalition. Safia was an incredible revolutionary. I don't, when you talk about how people do a lot of things, I mean, Safia was uh, being a mother or a grandmother, had a full-time, very, very important job in the legal scene, working with prisoners and other people, and she led the move, and she, she was incredible in taking on all the political prisoners. She, and, and created, after she founded the Mumia Coalition and felt that the Mumia's immediate life was not in, threat, in, in danger in the same way and that there were other people to take it on, she moved on to Jericho to create an organization for all political prisoners. And Safi used to tell me, I'm not a good detail person. She used to say that about herself, that she's not a good detail. So one day she left the coalition without taking care of any of the details. <laughs> Meaning details like who's going to take over for Safia Bukhari, who's this amazing leader and is irreplaceable. Mumi always calls her irreplaceable. You know, she was irreplaceable. She really was irreplaceable. I still can feel the effects of Safia's passing, both in, in the whole political prisoner movement. Safia had a vision of political prisoner work that was so developed and so serious. I remember when the first Jericho demonstration happened in 1998 in Washington, all these big names people spoke, Ben Chavez, all kinds, I think Angela was even there, they all spoke, and at the end when everybody started getting on the bus, Safia spoke. And there was like a tiny fraction of the people left, and she gave an analysis that I thought, shit, all these people left, and she just gave the best speech of the day. She talked about how, why the movement as a whole should deal with political prisoners and what it meant. And I remember I was not going to, I did not go back on my bus. Where's Bob Letterer? Bob. I remember going back, I think, on your bus or some other bus I went to, got on, because I was just not going to finish, leave until I heard Safia. Safia was that kind of person. You wanted to hear what she had to say. So, lo and behold, she goes to do Jericho. Who can fault that? It's like Mumia said if, about Ramona. She said, he said, if Ramona, after the bombing of 1985, had decided to drop it all and give up political work, oh, let me lay back a little. Could anybody have faulted her? Could anybody have said she didn't have a right to do that? But Ramona didn't do that. Okay, well, Safia, when she left the New York Coalition, how could you fault her? She went on to do Jericho. She went on to do a million things that she didn't deal with who was going to take over and all that. You know, it was unfortunate, but, you know, we can't have the same people do everything. So uh, I decided to, at that point, it looked realistic, like, you know, it looked like really I was going to be the only one of the people left who was going to have the, the time, whatever. And I was already doing a lot of the work. And uh, people agreed that it made sense for me to take over at that time. But there were many people who didn't like that in the movement and were not happy and thought it some, should be somebody black. I asked various black people if they wanted to do it. <laughs> Guess what? They didn't want to do it or couldn't do it, you know? So I took it on and I can't say it was easy, but I don't regret it. I don't regret it for a minute. In fact, I don't regret any of my commitments. I don't regret any of them. And I was very honored to work with Pam, with Ramona, later on with Sadiq, with many other people in the movement who supported us. And, you know, and it was, you know, like I say, a, uh, a great honor and a huge responsibility. And it was difficult for me recently to pull back because you know, I just felt I had to, but it's not easy to do that when you've been doing something for over 20 years. 
And I think I actually started do, doing Mumia work before this whole scene in the late 80s. But by 1995, I was doing it full time. And, um, you know, that's, that's how it became. And I just want to say how I became involved in the Mumia work originally. Safia was speaking somewhere in Harlem on the New York Three. The New York Three had just had lost their appeal when everybody thought they had a great chance of winning. The New York Three was, her, was um, Jaleel Muntakeen, uh, Noah Washington, and who's the third person? Oh, Herman Bell. Herman Bell. Safi was completely involved with the three of them. And they, had, they thought they really had a shot at it. And when they were turned down, she said she didn't think she could go on anymore. And I walked into this event. I had met her once before. And she was practically in tears, saying, I had to take a week off because I couldn't go and tell their mothers and their partners that they lost. That even though they were 100% justified and right, that they lost the trial. And she went on, and I listened to her, and I thought, oh my god, the pain and the sacrifice that people make for our brothers and sisters in prison. I'm going to help her. I'm going to help her. I just, I didn't know how, and I offered to help her. And um, sure enough, the rest is history, or her story, <laughs> you know? So that's how I became involved. And then, of course, Safi invited me to in introduce me to Pam. Pam introduced me to Ramona. And uh, it was obviously an amazing movement. Again, this movement was like none other that I had been in. I had been in many movements. But the level of leadership, um, the level of people to, to work with Safia Bukhari, to work with Pam Africa, to work with Ramona Africa, you know, how can you, how can you not think that you're absolutely blessed, absolutely blessed to have had that opportunity? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, go. Short. Uh, can you give us a rundown on all the wonderful lawyers and some of them not so hotsy totsy, but we the lately miracle lawyers? How did you find them? How did you recruit them? What you went through? I didn't recruit them. I didn't find them. The only person that I really, no, actually the two lawyers that I fought for, one was uh, Christina Swarns of the NAACP, and I later regretted that. Uh, and in fact, when I did an, a dinner, worked, I worked tirelessly for this honor, dinner to honor these two new lawyers, and I remember going over to Pam in the middle, and we were all saying how excited, because the lawyer before was so bad that I was thrilled that we had them. And I remember whispering to Pam, I hope I don't have to eat these words, meaning that I was praising them so much. Sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, they betrayed Mumia. Um, and I, I fought for Bob uh, Boyle, whom I'd known for years. And, and how did you find them? Christina, we found, she was NAAC. How did we find Bob Boyle? We know Bob Boyle's history as a lawyer who's defended quite a few political prisoners from Daruba bin Wahad and had some major victories and was a movement lawyer. Now, he, you know, he's had disagreements uh, with us way back, but he's been phenomenal. And that's how, but I did not, I have not been on top of the legal thing all the time. It's not been my priority, but I did like Bob. And originally, I really liked Christina. She's very smart. She's very smart. That's the question. OK. I think if there's any other questions, please email. Email Suzanne the question. She needs your question. But we want to, um, to really thank Suzanne. Thank you, SB. <laughs> for all her work. I wanted, I wanted her. I think one, one case that is really key in anti-racist work in, in New York City is the Central Park case. And I wanted her to talk about that. A few of us worked, you know, that committee that I said, the 
Interna no, the International Working Women's Day Committee um, took with Suzanne, uh -huh. took that on. So I want Suzanne to talk about that. Yeah, two more questions. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions. Finish that one. Suzanne. Finish this one first? Okay. So um, when that case first happened uh, in New York, um, all hell broke loose, not only with the city as a whole, but within the movement. There were huge divisions and discussions and um, feminists versus black people. A lot of it came down on that. And uh, to make a long story short, because of that, we were approached as a women's group who had politics around women's issues to support these five young men and say that it is in our interest as women, as mothers, to support them, and that there was no conflict between being a feminist and being a supporter of women and supporting justice for these young black men. And the people who came to see us and asked for us to take that on were Namza Brath, Alambe Brath's partner and long term partner in the struggle, and Sharan Salam, who was the mother of one of the defendants. And they came to our meeting and uh, they said, we need your help. We need it immediately. And we don't have time for a lot of discussion. We don't have a lot of time for a lot of debate. These kids' lives are at stake. We need you now. So we quickly went into gear and took on the case. And um, I played a particular role because uh, I'm white and they wanted a white woman who's identified as a feminist to speak publicly on behalf of these young men. And um, there was one event we had at 1199, a big event, a crowd turned out, and um, there was a lot of tension again between feminists and black people, and we tried to bridge that gap in some way. And, um, we, I spoke on television, I was on, on a television, daytime television show, and Renee, your mother saw me. Your mother saw me, and she said, I love you, Suzanne, but you were completely wrong. And it was one of those occasions when I walked out, and you know, these things don't bother me at all, because when the enemy attacks me, I really don't give a shit. I never feel bad about that, I feel good. So I got a, a, a standing boo ovation <laughs> from that whole crowd. As I walked out of the studio, it was Channel 11, the women were booing me, booing me. And um, it was so hard to get through to them. At one point, I finally said something to them. I said, look, do you remember that case? A lot of you may remember. Remember that those young men who had raped this um, mentally challenged young woman and had raped her with a broomstick or something, something in New Jersey, a horrible, horrible story. And when it happened, some people were saying, you know, these kids should go to jail, what they did. And for, mo for the most part, large numbers of people, the, the majority of the white, white population said, boys will be boys. And uh, this, you know, this is just innocent stuff that boys do. And so I, I'm standing before this crowd and I said, do you all remember that other case in New Jersey when people were saying boys will be boys? How come you don't say the same thing about these boys, whether you know whether they're guilty or not? How come you're so ready to go to, that was the only time they shut up for even a minute. At any rate, uh, I spoke a lot about this. Others, our whole group worked it out over and over again. We went to demonstrations and so on. But the most painful part of that is that several key black feminists, and I don't mean bourgeois feminists, I really don't. I mean people who are in the movement said that I should have shut up because as a white woman, I didn't have to deal with black uh, young black men's rapist behavior or whatever. And that was so hard to take. That was very hard to take and very discouraging. And um, at one point I was interviewed, I was just telling Mumia this story the other day, and I said that uh, some writer, a feminist writer, was writing a book on white anti-racists and she came to interview me. And at the end she says, well, if you had to do it all over again, would you do it again? And I said, no. I said, no, it was too painful. 
to do. Now, of course, I'm so glad I did it. And I'm so glad that I did what I did and that all of us did and our committee was phenomenal and uh, NUMSA really facilitated that in Sharan. But it's sad that I was so discouraged by that. And it just shows how, and I say this all the time, standing up to the enemy is easy compared to dealing with internal contradictions in our movement. Those are the most painful, the most difficult, the most discouraging, and the ones that we have to learn how to deal with so that we don't get discouraged, so I don't feel at the end of it, I shouldn't have done what I did. So that was amazing work that was done. Uh, and I just want to call Rosemary Mealy's name out and Phil Cruz, who's not with us anymore. Um, <laughs> a, women who have been a stand. Um, but you know, one of the real challenges with, with, for Suzanne was that she was working with women who, women of color who identified as womenists and not feminists, who, who actually call the name of the woman because these were children and their names were all over the press. You know, when you take a stand against racism as this group did, I mean, history absolves us because we were right. We were right. And, um, I tell Suzanne she has to write the story. Listen, the articles by black feminists blasting us still exist because they did it in books. Still exists. Friends of ours, close friends, were not talking to us in years because we took this stand. So that it's putting that little bit more that just that little bit more. And as I said in the beginning, Suzanne is unstoppable, you know? And that's what makes her the freedom fighter that she is. You know, it's not about, it's about solidarity, but solidarity from, this is also my struggle, not from the outside. I'm gonna give, we have two more uh, questions. <laughs> yeah, she's she's not. Um, Mama. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a story that's the funniest story you can think of that you haven't told somebody yet? Ooh. Yeah. A funny story. Funny story. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. A secret story. <laughs> Leave it to Isabel to make me speechless. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Clara, can you help me? Can you think of a story I should tell? The divorce party? Do you all know about the divorce party? <laughs> when um, when Cl Clara's father and I split up, after all these court appearances that were insane, insane, fighting over who's going to be, who Clara is going to be with during Jewish holidays. <laughs> I mean, insane, insane battles. Anyway, finally it ended and we signed a divorce agreement. And I don't know what made me think of it, but we had a divorce party at my house. A divorce party. And it was a great party. It was a great... <laughs> and uh, a lot of people don't know that story. And I just thought people should know that there are celebrations you can have that are a little bit unorthodox. But um, an aunt of mine said she was really sorry I didn't invite her since I didn't invite her to my wedding, which I didn't have. I should have at least invited her to my divorce party. <laughs> so she, she read, she read, you have gotta say that, come on. So the divorce party consisted of reading from the actual, what? Acting out, I had Hattie Gossett, who's a well-known poet, and Espy officiated this, um, 
<laughs> this divorce. <laughs> and the divorce considered, uh, consisted of, party of reading from his charges against me. He's a lawyer. So word for word, we took, they read from the document. She would be so busy at night and staying up late that she wouldn't even kiss me goodnight. <laughs> she criticized me for the way I did laundry. She, I mean, the most ridiculous, ridiculous, you'd think this guy would be embarrassed. He'd be so embarrassed if he knew I was saying this. I mean, he was a political activist. This is not somebody, he should be, he what? should have been embarrassed writing it. <laughs> and then something, I mean, just ridiculous stories. And people were sitting there, could not believe. They said, no, no, no. This, he didn't write this, did he? Yes, these were, we never changed a word. And it just showed the level of patriarchy, really, of patriarchy, of a man communicating what he thought he was entitled to from his wife. You know, that I was supposed to do all these things and he thought a judge would understand that he was a terrible victim, a terrible victim of these crimes. So that was a lot of fun. Espy was of course there, Renee was there, um, Clara of course she was, and Amilcar was there. <laughs> the kids were there and Myrna, where's Myrna? Myrna was there, we all laughed, laughed, laughed. And but, but especially, the question kept saying, he didn't really say those things, did he? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. His big charge was that Suzanne spent time organizing, which took away time from him. It was amazing. Okay, next question. No, you ask your question. I want to, those that don't know, this is my son over here. Original DJ. So uh, we were here talking about uh, just our memories, me and Clara Anna, and uh, we were wondering what was it like taking us to Florida uh, on that trip <laughs> to Key West. Before before you answer that, just so that people know, look. Uh, so, Suzanne adopted Clara Anna, and then she needed family. So, Amika became her big brother. You know, I'm her auntie. We have this extended family going on. So, there, there was this time where he really wanted to go to Florida. He really wanted to go to Florida because he wanted to swim with the dolphins. <laughs> I think you were 10? Yeah, he had to be like 1990. Yeah, he had to go. And you know, I'm, I don't have that much money. I mean, people know me. So I raised a lot of money for a lot of people, but you know, my, my pocket. So I figured out how I could give enough money to Suzanne to take him. And um, so she took, she took the kid. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, of course, you know they're both only children. And they both kept accusing each other of acting like only, only children. <laughs> He's so spoiled. He always has to have his way. She always gets her way. <laughs> but they were wonderful. They're very different. Amilcar was amazing swimming with the dolphins. He jumped in the water and he looked like he was a dolphin. He was really incredible. He was really incredible. And Clarana picked out, looked at some jewelry. I remember they were just wonderful. They were really wonderful. They were both beautiful, beautiful children. And uh, they were basically very nice to each other. And uh, I remember I ran out of money, like I always did on these trips, because they were always more expensive than I could handle. But I figured, what the hell? So, uh, <laughs> you know, there we were. And so we figured out how we were going to manage the rest of the trip with less money. And they were both very reasonable and wonderful. 
the, the other thing that is within the political work, part of our political work was and is our children, right? And that what happens a lot in the movement is that the children get estranged from the family because you don't give them what they want, you know? And um, Suzanne always, always worked on figuring out how to give the children what they want, what they needed. And she's still doing it today, okay? So I think we're good on the questions. We have one last question. From HGIC, the head G in charge. Oh. Okay. And by the way, a round of applause for Russell Bruin shows and his two great daughters. Thank you. Well, Suzanne, I don't know you as personally as everyone else, um, for the most part, most people here in the room, but I distinctly remember you about 12 years ago, I think, is when I, I met you. And you had this um, name, Golden, or something like that. And yeah, Goldie. Goldilocks. Goldilocks, right. And I said, Goldilocks, who is that? And they said, oh, well, eventually you'll meet her. And, uh, but she's a force, and she's doing so much work. And uh, her and Pam are close. I said, oh, OK, I, I'm looking forward to it, because I hadn't met this Goldilocks. So um, <laughs> when I seen her, she was with Pam when I first met her. And I said, well, I'll be damned. Too little, um, like, I, the first thing I thought about were you being like uh, sticks of dynamite. Because you were both short. And <laughs> I seen you all together, and I was like, all that I had heard about you and all the wonderful work that you were doing, I was like, that's going to be a powerful, and I know they already were a powerful team, something like dynamite. So every time I seen you all together, I always thought of you as being so powerful, especially um, side by side with Pam. So I was just telling my sister, I had one to ask how you stayed looking, because 12 years ago, you looked the same as the day I met you. <laughs> And someone had already asked the question. And I said, what I want to ask is going to be referring to the Goldilock thing. I said, I don't know how she'll feel about that. But every time I feel like working for my dad or feel like that I'm getting exhausted or tired, I think of folks like Pam and others who keep doing the work who have been doing it well before me. And it just inspires me to keep going. So thank you both. Thank you. OK, we have one comment and then the last question. Hey. <laughs> hey. So um, it might turn into a question, but it's more so a comment. Um, I don't remember exactly when I met you. I feel like I've always known you. So I can't remember the exact moment, but I came to Philly in 93. And it was not long after when I met you. So it's probably been 20 years or more. Um, and, well, the first thing I remember is your beautiful smile. You just light up a room. And I'm thinking, what a sweet woman. And then I saw the fierce side. I'm like, what? How does she balance this sweet, kind, lovely demeanor with, fuck the system? You know, I'm like, how does she do that? I love it. I love it. But I wanted to thank you personally and in front of all of our dear friends as being one of the many people who inspire me on a daily basis and for providing a model for me of what a white woman radical revolutionary looks like. Wow. Sue, Sue Africa was the first one I met who did that for me. But right behind Sue Africa, I met this woman. And I aspire to be like you. And I guess I do kind of a question. Um, not only do I want to know how you look so great, like Teresa said, but are you going to give me the hint on all your fashion and earring tips and stuff? Because 
every time I see her, I'm complimenting her on her earrings. You see, I tried to put on some that might impress her, um, but I can't keep up with her fashion. I mean, I need to know all your, you know, your tips of where you shop. All right, thank you so much, but thank you so much. You do so much for me. Thank you, baby. I, I do want to thank Suzanne again for having been a role model for me for many, many years about how, as a white person, you can dedicate your life to anti-racism and justice. And now that you're 80, I would like to know how you're going to, in what way you see yourself as continuing what the transition to being an elder is for you, what it means for us. I'm expecting you to be that role model for me again. And, you, and we're all struggling, some of us now are struggling with what it means to become an elder in this movement. How does that role change? What, how, do we, how do we do that? What do we, th what do we think about how to become an elder in this movement? Thank you, thank you. Um, I call everybody babies these days because people are 75 for babies for me. <laughs> so um, one thing I want to announce publicly is that I really do plan to start writing my memoirs almost immediately, almost immediately. Um, <clears throat> and I know those of you I'm close to have heard me talk about this for a long time, but for the first time, I know deep inside that I'm going to do it, that I'm going to do it. And um, we heard we went to, SP and I were at an event for Numza Brath turned 75 a few months ago, and we were there. And SP talked about Numza's role around the Central Park Five, and we were talking again. We talk and talk again and again about the same. That case was so heavy, so profound, objectively in the world and for all of us who were involved personally. So SP asked me, said, look, you gotta write that story. And she said she'd help me. And that night, I started writing that story. And there's a lot of my memoirs that I have written, like the early years of my life, when I was traveling around the world, and the Nazi Holocaust, and so on. So I think it's important. Isselina was one of the people for years back, said, you've got to write your memoirs. I said, who's going to read them? She says, I will. <laughs> you know. So we have one reader guaranteed. <clears throat> But, uh, you know, I kind of, I talked to Mumia about it the other day. He said, look, we, if we don't write our own history, someone else will tell the story differently and not the way we want it. So that's one thing. But the, the conflict is, and Naomi knows this because she experiences it too, the conflict is, you know, this moment is so exciting right now with Mumia. We've had such amazing victories and the move breakthrough around those children in Philadelphia. What's happening with, I mean, in the midst of the horror story that we see of the world, I mean, really a horror show internationally, everywhere from Venezuela to uh, Yemen to Syria, everything that's happening around the world. We happen to be having a really positive series of events in relation to Mumia. That didn't come from nowhere. We've only been working at it. Move has been working on this. Pam has been at this since before Mumia was arrested. But for the first time, I can really envision Mumia being released. I really can envision Mumia being released. And you know, right after that comes Move. It's not unconnected. Um, so there's that, and uh, Mumia just came out with a book. I don't know how many of you saw it, Black Lives Matter. And um, before I knew it, when I've been swearing I was going to write these memoirs, I called Pam and said, I'm doing a book party for this book. I said, you know, she was busy doing something. She wasn't even listening to me hardly. <laughs> she said, okay, okay. <laughs> you heard me. And I wrote Mumia. <laughs> so the work is very, I'm deeply committed to it, I'm deeply engaged. When I see an opportunity where I feel I should be doing something, it's very hard to say no to myself. Not that anyone else, uh, to myself. So uh, the possibilities are endless and, you know, I'm just going to have to balance it. But it's not easy to give up. And I'm not giving it up, but to even pull back. I was working with uh, France Fanon's daughter, Marais Mendes France. We were talking about putting out something around the legal stuff internationally. 
I proposed it to her. I said, let's do it, you know? So I'm constantly, my ideas are endless. Okay. My daughter, who's in charge, tells me we have to wind up. <laughs> so there's a question from Umia. So the last and final question for the night is from Mumia. I desperately tried to get a recording of him asking the question, but it didn't work out with time restraints. So Isabel will read off his question to my mom. Yes, I will. <laughs> All right, Mumia's question. Suzanne, you've been, f you've been involved or in or seen many movements. What would you tell a young person who wanted to join the movement? What's the most important lesson you'd impart? Mm. <laughs> so I'll try not to be long-winded about it, but um, the first thing, and again, um, Mumia writes about, um, he was addressing Evergreen College, I think it was, about 10 years ago. And he said, if, you know, he said different things and then he said, if there are any of you out there who are considering committing your life to revolution, let me encourage you to take that path because it is a very rewarding one. And I think he gave, I'm pretty sure he gave Ramona as an example at the time of how she gave up law school and gave up what she, and you know, you never see Ramona saying she regretted it. And I remember Naomi at the end of a film on the Weather Underground, um, they asked her if she had to do it again. She said, I would do it all over again. Smarter and better. Uh, and that's really what I feel too. Uh, but, uh, you know, you do smarter and better, but I think that's the advice I would give a young person. If you are considering giving your life to revolutionary activity, do it. Do it. It's worth it. It's not easy. It's not like glory comes with it. <laughs> it's not like everyone's going to cheer night and day and say, oh, you know. But it is worth it. In the end, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. Because the alternatives, being part of this bourgeois, rotten, fucked up society, is not what I wanted at 18 years old. I was hoping for something different. And I remember seeing the snick young people and thinking, if only I had their courage. If only I could do what John Lewis did, I hate to say it now, <laughs> given what John Lewis has done, but that he was so courageous and stood up to the beatings. How many beatings, how many concussions he put up. And, and just watching people, I thought that is the life I want, to make that kind of commitment that I care that much about it. Let me tell you, I loved studying psychology. I was really into it, but I was telling someone today all the people, the people, I knew the field was so corrupt, so disgusting, that the people, I mean, the head of my department at Columbia had been, came out of the military. You know who conducted the torture experiments here in the United States? You know who was in charge of them? Two psychologists. Two psychologists. There was nothing in psychology other than the books I read and my caring about the people I worked with that attracted me, that wanted me to say, oh, I'm going to give my life to do this. I didn't want to be a... A, a successful psychologist. I didn't give a shit about that. Run? But I did want to be someone who made a difference in terms of changing the world to become a more just one. And so that's the lesson, the first thing I would say to young people. If you're considering it, do it. Do it. It's not easy. You'll find support, but it's worth it. There's Sally O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> Sally always had a tendency. Sally always had a tendency to be a little late. <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, Sally. I'm delighted to be here. And Sally was one of those people who were always there. She was with us in the Central Park children's case that we were talking about. Uh, now I have two mics. So before we bring out the cake, we're going, 
you want to introduce him? You introduce him. Introduce him. Actually, no, 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 no. Introduce him. Introduce. Introduce. That's Aurora's baby. Yeah. Here. Introduce them. The young people. So here's here's one. She, oh, she has me? the other wireless handout. Okay. Here. After that, I don't have the notes. They cannot stop us. All right, we're in for a treat now, everybody. We're in for a treat. We get to hear the third generation of MOVE activists okay. and the second one that's going to perform. Uh, Mike Africa, who had formed Seeds of Wisdom years ago with the children of the current MOVE, the MOVE leadership we know of, has formed this group, which is the grandchildren. These are the grandchildren of the MOVE 9, the grandchildren of the people who were killed in 1985. This is living proof of MOVE continuing its great legacy with the children continuing. And so I want to welcome our wonderful performers. Here they are. Give my hand, give him my hand. Um, I would just like to say, um, Susanna has been around longer than we've been alive, so... <laughs> so, like, give her a round of applause for Suzanne. We're going to do a song for y'all tonight called They Cannot Stop Us. Check, check. Check. Stopping on the toes of the system, strategically moving the plan, keeping in the flow with the wisdom, kicking out knowledge for revolutionary people. Even though the odds are stacked against us, enough is equal. We bring the power to the face of the beast. We've been shot, jailed, and beat, but still stay in the streets. When the rebel cry for freedom, like the voice of the one who's screaming, Free Momir, Peltier, move nine in them. We committed to the struggle, even though it is a struggle, but the system that imposed is a system in trouble. You don't even know how long the people been struggling with sleeves up and bumping it. Long before Columbus and posted De Leon in the killer cookies, the doors came ripping in the pillaging American shores. But we standing on the shoulders, these giants who be defying, stopping nothing while we're feeling our purpose until we triumph. Cops with the boots and bats on the attacks, they come up with guns, taking aim, shooting in backs. Shots from the gun in his order to tell the fifth the people because the system want to get rid of blacks. Cops with the boots and bats on the attacks. They come up with guns, taking aim, shooting in backs. Shots from the gun in his order to tell the fifth the people because the system want to get rid of blacks. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us in this mission. They got jails, but not enough to stop resistance. They got the guns and bombs they try to use against us, but the power of life is in us never ending. They got the Navy and Marines, they train and fight the battles. They got the Army and the Air Force that will attack you. They got the cops and the firemen they use against you. They got the politicians train the boys in your mental. They got all sorts and all types and all brands and all mix and all kinds and all breeds and all styles. It's all fake. It's all here to protect themselves from a stake of enslaving the people they bred a nation of pure hate. Cops with the boots and bats on the attacks. They come up with guns, taking aim, shooting in backs. Shots from the gun in this order to tell the professional people because the system want to get rid of blacks. Cops with the boots and bats on the attacks. They come up with guns, taking aim, shooting in backs. Shots from the gun in this order to tell the professional people because the system want to get rid of blacks. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They cannot beat us. They might as well join us. They
They can beat people, but they cannot stop us. They can shoot people, but they cannot stop us. They can kill people, but they cannot stop us. They can jail people, but they cannot stop us. They can beat people, but they cannot stop us. They can shoot people, but they cannot stop us. They can kill people, but they cannot stop us. They can jail people, but they cannot stop us. We are the people. They cannot stop us. We are united. They cannot stop us. We are committed. They cannot stop us. We're revolutionaries. They cannot stop us. We are the people. They cannot stop us. We are united. They cannot stop us. We are committed. They cannot stop us. We're revolutionaries. They cannot stop us. 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 Happy birthday, Suzanne! Happy birthday, Suzanne! Happy birthday! Happy birthday to Suzanne! Happy birthday! Drop knowledge, fall lists with no polish. It's Bob Rod when we go, drop the beat. Globe of the funk, and an over the bunk. So we hit the mofos with some ghetto funk. Drop knowledge, fall lists with no polish. It's Bob Rod when we go, drop the beat. Globe of the funk, and an over the bunk. So we hit the mofos with some ghetto funk. Crash and burn, they gon' crash and burn inevitably because fools never learn. They think they gon' leave the people in the lurch while they escape the mess they created, but they will see dirt. Cause karma is the payback, what goes around comes. They put the holes in the ozone, they burn by the sun. They expect to do the wrong they do to me. You in no real retaliation, cause what else is new? But they might some with all together, different power level. All the ego in the world couldn't be enough to help them. Man against man wasn't challenging enough. Now it's man against man against the planet and beyond Dropping bombs on the moon What they thinking this is Hollywood and they platoons They don't recognize reality cause they buffoons Destroying planets that they need but they act immune They confuse, drop knowledge, flawless With no polish, just power but rise When we go drop the beat Global the funk and the noble the bunk So we hit the mofos with some ghetto funk Drop knowledge, flawless With no polish, just power but rise When we go drop the beat Global the funk, and then over the bunk. So we hit the mofos with some ghetto funk. Patroon is the word that could best describe. When the havoc they create, come they run and hide. Not to a different city, to a different atmosphere. Way above the clouds in another stratosphere. Abuse and misuse and deplete resources. And when they get to Mars, they repeat their courses. What they don't understand is the money used here. It's the very same mentality they use everywhere. Everywhere they go, they leave the mark of destruction. Pushing and polluted, but at one time it wasn't. Used and abused and discarded as worthless. The same way they treat the animals in a circus. Treating life like they don't need it. They get examples that they wrong, but they never heed them. Treating people like we wrong, cause we out there speaking. But when the water cover earth, tell me what you eating? What you eating? Drop knowledge, flawless, with no polish, just power but rise. When we go drop the beat, global the funk, and then over the bunk. So we hit the mofos with some ghetto funk. We want to thank them. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Powerful, powerful. And we will, you know, we continue to honor Suzanne Ross. It is your 80th birthday, girl. Kick ass. Kick ass, Suzanne Ross. Okay, Amivka, they're trying to set up. Yeah, you. Mariposa has come. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Ooh, let me just introduce you. Does everybody know who Mariposa is? Mariposa is a fierce, young, revolutionary artist, supporter of Oscar Lopez Rivera, played a key role in his liberation and in organizing with the uh, women. Um, what were they called, the women? Uh, the 35, the 35, women. 35 women in support of Oscar, and she has been fighting personal struggles and political struggles since I know her when she was little. Yeah. <laughs> since I was a little baby. <laughs> Very courageous, strong sister. I wanted to share because, um, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm limited, but I just want to thank you, Suzanne, for the times that you took in your um, in your life to listen and to be there for me when I was really fighting for my, for my life. 
like really fighting for my life. And um, when you're in your 20s and in your 30s and you're um, you know, spending weeks in, in psychiatric wards and fighting internalized colonialism, um, th that is fighting for your life, like fighting for your, for your mind. And um, so I love you. And thank you for your work, and thank you for your work. So I was inspired, I only have one minute. So I was inspired, I'm not gonna sing my version of God Bless America. I please, por favor, God Bless America. But because you were born on the 4th of July, and I remember that you told me that you were born on the 4th of July. This is a really quick poem by Naomi Long Majet, and it's called Midway, because I know that you're celebrating 80, right? Um, but um, there are many miles to go. <laughs> many miles to go, we're affirming that for, um, for all of us and, and for you on this beautiful Mother Earth. And uh, my, my gift to you, um, Suzanne, is to um, continue to take care of myself and my health and my mind and to live as long if I could only live as long and to keep fighting for the rest of my life. And that is my promise. That is my promise to you. So these are some words by Naomi Long Majet, amazing poet, who um, the piece is called Midway, Midway. I've come this far to freedom and I won't turn back. I'm climbing to the highway from my old dirt track. Now, this is actually, this is for Suzanne, but this is for everyone in this room. I don't know, where's, where's um, Pam Africa? This is for, this is for SP. This is because you, Suzanne that likes to do everything collectively, right? So this is for all of us, okay? This is for all of us in this movement and this struggle, and, and especially for the birthday girl. I've come this far to freedom and I won't turn back. I'm climbing to the highway from my old dirt track. I'm coming and I'm going and I'm stretching and I'm growing and I'll reap what I've been sowing on my skin's not black. I've prayed and slaved and waited and I've sung my song. You've bled me and you've starved me but I've still grown strong. You've lashed me and you've treated me and you've everything but freed me but in time you'll know you need me and it won't be long. I've seen the daylight breaking high above the bow. I found my destination and I've made my vow. So whether you abhor me or deride me or ignore me, mighty mountains loom before me and I won't stop now. Happy birthday. Thank you, baby. Happy birthday. Thank you. All right, and now please Give it up like you have never given it up before. Give all your love to Circa 95. Yes. Happy birthday, Suzanne. Thank you so much for supporting us, especially supporting artists, you know? A lot of times people separate the arts and culture and the movement and put us all in different boxes and places. But you bring us all together, especially during the holidays, and you make the best lacquers and applesauce. One, it's the best. two. <laughs> I love the holidays. Two? Yeah. So everybody's having a good time? The food was great, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Let's make some uh -huh. noise for everybody that organized and Clara Anna for the decorations, everything. It's a great time tonight. So it's all about family and love. So, That's what we're so, about. So for this one right here, I need y'all to put your peace signs in the air one time. Like that. And we're going to wave them back and forth. Yeah, we're going to party right into the birthday. Can you... Okay. Wave. Wave. Let's go. Aquí yo estoy preparada y hecha. Cuando llegué, no me recuerdo la fecha. Nueva York, la ciudad tan grande y fría. Ven pa' comer en la casa de mi tía. Todos los días pa' la escuela pública. Mucha clase diferente, música. Cuando quiere, ven visite por acá. Mucha gente que se ha ido llorará. Un día vamos a vernos. Oh. Chócame los dedos que se oiga el mundo entero Sé que a ti te gusta lo que tiene mi caramelo Ven, consigue, si no tiene papeles te persigue Escucha, aquí estamos todos en la lucha Pa' todas las chicas del can, todas las chicas del can Boricua, dominicana de la gran manzana Si no te gusta no te viste porque no va Soy de dos mundos y lenguaje no fui yo que compré el pasaje Pero aquí estoy La calle no es de oro pero no gusta el coro Esto pa' mi gente que todos son tesoro 
seen a high birth Uptown, Uptown where I lived The Bronx, the Heights We had to fight for freedom Too late to be black Too black to be Spanish Contradictions of life, yo Living on this planet All we need is love And a little understanding All, All we, we need, need is love And a little understanding, understanding. Whoa, Come on. burning till my lungs hurt Blood, sweat, working some tears I've been working for years now Everybody know the name Cheers, we be getting it in Four finger ring rats putting up wins Begin every choice a chess move You don't wanna the test, test dude. dude I ain't in the best mood Ain't no room for rest cause This is not a restroom Moving at the speed of light Life is full of contradictions Like you know you wrong But it feels so Might be making dollars But it isn't making sense Who's the clueless where you going Cause you don't know where we went And you never got the message Cause the message wasn't sent no, the message wasn't sent Represent, represent We still tripping in the trap While most these other rappers Going gonzo when they rap Telling tall tales on the track When fact is fiction Fiction is fact So where you at? La calle no es de oro, pero no gusta el coro. Esto es para mi gente que todos son tesoro. La piscina hybrid, uptown where I live. The Bronx Heights, we had to fight for freedom. Too late to be black, too black to be Spanish. Contradictions of life, yo, living on this planet. All we need is love and a little understanding. All we need is love and a little understanding. Word. Vamos a buscar la verdad, aunque no está cerca. Power to the people. Despierta. Wake up. Now or never, I know you've seen it all, but we could do it better, yeah, we could do it better. Corre, corre camino, pronto llega el destino, matan los enemigos que cuando caen no fuimos. You ain't never catching us, dollar van, train, no of us, no there's nothing to discuss. It's the sound of the city where survival is a must, always in a rush. And there's no one you could trust, no, no one you could trust. Con nadie confíe, salva lo que consigue, todo pa' tu gente, lo demás no le demente. Palante, pa' frente, todo estamos presente, palante, pa' frente. Todos estamos presentes, pa' adelante, pa' frente, todos estamos presentes, pa' adelante, pa' frente, todos estamos presentes. La calle no es de oro, pero no gusta el coro. Esto es pa' mi gente que todos son tesoros. La piscina hybrid, uptown where I live. The Bronx, the Heights, we had to fight for freedom. Too light to be black, too black to be Spanish. Contradictions of life, yo, living on this planet. All we need is love and a little understanding. Say what? All we need is love and a little understanding. Word. Peace and love. Peace and Happy love. birthday, Suzanne! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Really? Woo, woo! So birthday's time, right? Happy birthday, yeah. All right, let's sing happy birthday, everybody! <laughs> C-Ray's got the right idea, right? With the candle. <laughs> We also popping some blubbly, so I think we're also gonna do a toast and a cheers, right? So, ready? What are we doing? <laughs> no, happy birthday, sing. Vamos. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Susan. Happy birthday to you. Oh, one, two, three. Happy birthday. Come on. Thank you, Mariposa. Come on. What? It's a big one. Birthday to you. Uh huh. Happy birthday. Uh huh. Come on, come on, B, I hear ya. Come on, happy birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> y que cumpla mucho más. What? Everybody, man, a wish. A vibrant health and prosperity and abundance. What else do we want to give to Zen? Love. 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 We want to give love. Right? And well being yeah. and yeah. victories. Oh, yes. Yeah. Champagne. Okay. Champagne. Blow your candles. Okay. Yes. Give me like a countdown. I'm Bronxy. I need your help. Come on. Yes. Go. All we need is love. On the count of three, let's blow out the candles. Ready? One, two, three. Yay! Happy 80 
to many, many more. Well, let's go to chat with glasses of champagne. Yes. You want to put it on the table? Oh, let's put some music too. Oh, yeah, I got the <laughs> Revolution! <laughs> to revolution! Where is the champagne? Everybody got a cup? There you go. Okay. Suzanne wants to toast to revolution. To revolution. Revolution. And to victory. Victory and the freedom of all political prisoners. And to bring capitalism down. Smash the state. Off the pigs. <laughs> Just for you, Suzanne. There you go. I want to quickly thank first my daughter. Where is Clara? Clara Anna. Clara, Clara Anna. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, thank you for producing this whole thing, for insisting that we have a celebration and a party, for pulling it all together in the midst of a minion crisis. I really want to thank you. Thank my beautiful grandchildren for all their love and joy that they give me. Specifically for Espy for pulling this together tonight. <clears throat> For Joe Friendly, who came and volunteered to, f to film this session, to um, the people who traveled from afar, from other states. Uh, Bronxy wants to say something? What do you want to say? Okay, we'll talk in a minute, okay? To Lalanne, who produced that beautiful, beautiful collage, which I messed up in printing, but it is really a beautiful look. Please look at it. She put together a political history of my life and included this movement and so many of you to, uh, again, to Bob for all he's done, to the Move family, to Pam, who's been this unbelievable comrade, and to Ramona, to <clears throat> Amina, who came despite the fact that she wasn't feeling well and who knew that I would be devastated if she wasn't here. <laughs> She came, who came, because she knew I really wanted her here. You want to say that? Go ahead, real quick. Happy birthday, Mama. Thank you. Thank you, this beautiful, beautiful child. This beautiful child. To all of you, again, for the love you've given, for being here, for being so generous in so many ways, and for hanging in there yourselves with all the sacrifice you all have made. So thank you, and happy birthday to all of us. There's also, in addition, oh, let me tell you, again, first of all, let me remind people that uh, not only is it Sadiq's birthday today, but Naomi Jaffe turned, she's a baby, she turned 74 on the 26th a few days ago. Where's Naomi? My baby friend there. To uh, Clara Anna, who's going to be 35 years old, it's hard to believe, on the 9th of July. <clears throat> um, who else is birthdayed around this time? Am I forgetting someone? July 23rd, July 23rd for Mariposa. <clears throat> and for anyone else, uh, again, thank you, thank you so much for this gift of love. Oh, and the money. I will. All right, Pam reminds me. I need to explain. Uh, folks, folks, <clears throat> people called Clara and asked if I wanted presents or what they should get me. And whoever called was given the response that there's someone, shh. Can I please have your attention in the back? Hey, Clara, Sally, can I just uh, make sure everyone hears this? That um, there's someone in prison who's now in isolation, actually, at Frackville Prison, a brother who's been in prison for I don't know how long, decades and decades and decades. When Mumia was very sick, he went to the prison warden who was walking through on the ground, on the, through the prison. He said, this man belongs 
in a hospital or at least an infirmary. He does not belong here. And the warden told him to mind his own business. And he says, he is my business. He's my brother. He's going to die if you, if you don't get him the medical help. And we trace a lot of the fact that they had to move, even though obviously we had a huge movement supporting him, to that heroic action. Of course, he was immediately transferred from Mahanoy, the prison was con which is considered a little better in conditions, to Frackville, which is worse. And he was immediately put in isolation with a trumped up charge that he smuggled in drugs <coughs> through a stamp on a letter. I mean, the insanity they come up with. So this brother is now fighting for a trial for himself. And um, he's had a lot of help from Rachel Walkenstein, but his attorneys are in, I think, I can't remember who his attorneys are. And he needed some money. And aside from the money, um, I really thought we should show our appreciation and our respect for a brother who was so courageous so courageous and paid such a heavy price. So that's why when we picked him as the person to collect money for, and please, I had beautiful note papers that I, I don't know what I did with them. So please write him notes. You, you can email them to me. You, most of you have my email address. I promise to forward them to him. I sent, I put my address there, but email is the easiest, just thank him. He already sent me a note, because Rachel told him I was doing this, and thanked me already for doing this, and how much it meant to him to feel that people are trying to help him. So this is no small thing. Remember, these small acts are big acts for someone in prison. And any note, don't feel, if you don't have any money, that's okay. Just write a note. Those of you who have money to give, great. If you don't, please write this brother a note telling him that you appreciate what he did. So let's remember Major Tillery is the brother's name. He's a hero. He's really a hero. And you're our hero, Suzanne. Happy birthday. Lahayim. All right, let's party, let's eat, let's drink, let's be merry, let's cake. To the DJ ref, get the party going. Salud. I was like, let's go see if we can take it, take it away.